Hello, um, my name is Ivana, and let me welcome you to Startup Crime Bratislava Doctors versus Machines. As a part of Future Now Festival, in collaboration with Campus Cowork, which is a co working space um, located in two locations, Campus Mlini and new newly opening in one month, Campus City. Um, we prepared uh, this panel discussion and um, as a part of, as I said, um, Future Now Festival, there is um, Future Now Conference, which you have already um, heard of. It's organized by Hub Hub and Neology and it's being held tomorrow at Refinery Gallery. Um, so it's the biggest tech and innovation conference, so be sure to be there. Um, thanks to the main partner, Decent, for letting this happen, and also our um, venue partner, Binarium. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to speaker. She uh, used to be executive manager of Slovak Alliance for Innovative Economics, and uh, today she's running her own startup, Freya Care, which helps men and women um, plan their family and uh, cover them financially. So please welcome Petra Zorovčinova. Thank you, Ivanka, and um, good evening, everyone. Um, I have the pleasure to moderate today's discussion. Uh, I'm very exciting to, excited to be talking about AI and uh, the medical field, because when you think about technology, um, it gives doctors and medical professionals access to the world's library of knowledge. And we can think about AI as an imperfect mirror that would use as getting clearer and clearer. So I have the pleasure of introducing our panel today. Um, let me start with Martin Meiernik, who is uh, a co-founder of uh, Black Swan Rational. It was an R&D for big data. Please take a seat. <laughs> Machine learning and applied AI solutions. He's also a co founder of SciCurve, that um, is a search engine um, for detecting life science trends. And he currently works as a product development lead at CAI that uh, builds startups in regulated fields. So he has a lot of experience with medical fields. Okay, next one Martin Herman. He is a co founder. You can welcome him on the stage. <laughs> um, he is a co-founder of uh, Betterum. It's a social sporting betting platform built on blockchain. He also founded Powerful Digital, which is a creative studio, and he's currently working on Powerful Medical that uh, brings innovative healthcare solutions um, to medical field, <laughs> obviously. Uh, <laughs> So Martin, welcome. And last but not least, uh, Jurai Bardi, uh, who has um, experience, please, in uh, public sector. Uh, he's been working in the sector since 2009. Um, he's an expert on digital innovation, and he is a managing partner of Alistic. Um, he's been implementing national e-health solution in Kosovo. And he is a regular speaker at uh, public policy conferences, ITAPA, in Slovakia. So, gentlemen, welcome on stage. And let me ask you first uh, question. Um, when we think about AI in healthcare, where do you see successful use cases? Thank you, good sir. Um, successful use cases of implementing AI in healthcare. Probably diagnostic field is the first one that comes to mind. Um, for example, in histology, we've seen a lot of softwares being implemented that basically detect false positives, you know, tell you that, um, that the tissue is not pathological and automatically uh, evade that and pass to the pathologist only pathological issues. Uh, you have supporting systems that identify different ty types of uh, tumors in, in, in the tissue, so that would be a very good example. Image processing in healthcare, in medical diagnostics. 
I, I would say that uh, the biggest problem in healthcare is that healthy people don't go to hospitals. So I think that one of the most reasonable and most useful things for uh, uh, machine learning or AI in the healthcare segment is prevention. So basically getting people to go to the hospital before they're sick. So you can analyze large amounts of data, you can do preliminary checks, maybe even warn the patient before he even has symptoms that would basically uh, send him to the hospital. So again, to repeat, healthy people don't go into hospitals, they don't do the regular preventive checks, they ignore it, uh, and they only come to the hospital once the, they sh start showing symptoms. And that usually means the problem is serious. So if you're able to to basically catch the sickness before the patient starts showing sicknesses, uh, symptoms, you really help. You really help out the whole uh, medical industry. May I ask you a follow-up question for that? Do you need to go to a hospital to actually utilize a preventive solution? Well, in today's world, maybe, maybe, still yes to some extent. But then again, technology is moving every day. So let's say. Apple came up with an iWatch, uh, the new iWatch uh, 4 series, I think. It can already detect um, uh, atrial fibrillation or some heart conditions before you realize and before you start to show symptoms. So it's already with wearables and with all those smart devices and with all those da datas that are out there, you can already run some preventive checks without actually having to go to the hospital. And I think that's where medical uh, AI is headed. So, as I uh, see uh, the problem that AI, uh, maybe it starts with uh, diagnostics uh, when the results can be found uh, quite easily and I believe uh, that uh, in future it will power what uh, we call personalized medicine uh, so every patient will get uh, treatment or medical advices uh, basically according to his genome or his lifestyle or another factor. So uh, this is the field of where we should move on. So maybe uh, the AI will humanizate uh, uh, medicine in the future so we can have real personalized advices all the time. We are a little bit far from that, aren't we? A little bit, don't you think? No? Okay. Um, maybe uh, another question following to that is, do you see doctors working with AI? Because before we started, we talked about being analog and not very digital. Uh, I'm not saying it's an issue with doctors, but for them, it's important to build trust and have transparent systems. So how do you perceive that? So I don't know how about AI, it's like a weird definition, like if you ask what AI is here, probably no one will agree. But let's talk about like mathematical modeling, or like advanced statistics, um, maybe machine learning. Um, doctors actually use already software that is powered by machine learning in some cases, uh, especially in operating rooms, you know, the robotic arms for nano uh, surgery are actually powered by machine learning, for example. Yes, they definitely need trust to actually, or the time to trust the technology, but most of the softwares that went through the regulatory bodies and were accepted were, are actually advisory tools, so they are not replacing any anyone. Um, they're just streamlining the process of diagnostics or whatever process you you have. Um, the big problem there with the doctors is their background in interpretation of data. So most of the doctors, unfortunately, cannot really interpret um, advanced statistics. And if you just pour like shitload of data on them, uh, it's really hard to interpret that even for IT skilled machine learning people. So if you just put it on the clinician, you know, it's very hard to interpret. And we definitely need to s help them interpret the data. So that, like if you are a designer or UX, UI guy, that's a definitely a field where you can help a lot. 
Yeah, I think uh, one of the main problems, at least what we've been facing here in, in Europe, and for a fact I know that it's not only a problem in Slovakia or in Europe per se, uh, it's also a problem in the US, is that uh, currently people, I think, believe that technology in medicine is uh, further than it actually is. So you have all these advanced machines, devices, for example, the robotic arms that perform microsurgery, and yes, there is some sort of uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence already in place, but the general medicine, the, the, the point of contact with the doctor, when you come to the hospital, what happens? So your data, it gets collected somewhere into one system, then uh, parts of it is in a different system, another part of it is in a third different system completely, and then who has access to all the data, that is still something we're trying to basically figure out. And, and you can also see it in Slovakia with the uh, digitalizacja zdravotnictva, which didn't really work out as good as uh, some people probably hoped, hoped it will work out. Uh, but I think at this stage, as you already said, machine learning in those machines and with uh, certain produ uh, producers of those machines is already used. But the problem we're facing right now, uh, at least with what we're doing, is that uh, we have all this data scattered in different places. Uh, no one has really access. So really this is something that before we're able to create something like what I suggested in the beginning, that we're able to predict illnesses. Before we're able to do that, we first need to figure this out. And this is, I think, what many people in the business still have to realize, right? So you cannot rely on some manufacturer of a device to give you the data. You have to figure out a way how to gather it universally. You have to set some data formats and data structures. And, and, and uh, in today's world, even though we live in the internet age where everyone has a smartphone and nonstop Facebook, Instagram, access to internet, in the medical, I think, segment, you cannot see that yet. So you're happy if the data is in digital form, but there is not a uh, uniform data format already available. Uh, as I've said, the, co the problems with who has access to data are also pretty big. So to be able to come to the point where we're actually able to predict sicknesses, we first need to clean all of this up. And I think this is currently the most pressing issues to move ahead in basically implementing AI and machine learning and all of those new technologies into medicine. I would ask you a follow-up question on how you're going, how you're proposing to solve it. But first, I have a question for Martin because you already um, started to talk about um, doctors and uh, interpreting data. So, um, do you think that doctors in the future or in the near future need to acquire new skills, like become more of a data scientist or health coaches, or where do you see them going? in like working with technology itself, do they need to learn new skills or would you make it so usable that they would understand it with their current education? So preferably I would really like our doctors to treat us and not to bother with data interpretation. Uh, it's actually uh, the responsibility of the product managers who deliver the solutions to medical, you know, industry to build a solution in a way that it's easy, easy to interpret or automatize to some extent that delivers the, the, the value immediately to the, cl to the clinician. Um, but uh, definitely they would need to learn how to read prevention data and they, they would need to have a bit more open op be more open-minded because new new regulation is coming, uh, new stuff is coming from IT. Uh, it's unstoppable, and some of the best practices that are kept since like 18th century, like for example, uh, assessing abdomen sounds by ear or you know touching patient, uh, these won't be uh, necessary anymore. We will be passively collecting data from the patient. It's like a car in the future, the patient is a I'd maybe also like to that, and uh, I know I'm probably going to insult a lot of doctors by saying this, but uh, one of the problems that we faced in the last year alone was that uh, the doctors who are in charge are unwilling to accept the new technology there. So the doctors who actually have a say in how things are going to be done, the ones who write the guidelines, are not always people who understand the technology and want to use it because they think it's going to replace them. So, and I can already see this in hospitals, we actually spend a lot of time in hospitals with the younger doctors and 
they, that get generation is basically the generation that already uh, knows how to use computers, know how, knows how to use the iPhone, but it's still going to take some time until they're in a position where they can actually set the rules. So that's maybe also a part of, of uh, the equation to actually fully implement machine learning and these new technologies in the medicinal field. So I actually, Martin, wanted to ask you um, now two questions. So how would you motivate <laughs> doctors uh, to use technology? Would you educate them first? And second, uh, you talked about um, basically structuring data in certain formats. Do you have a suggestion for your use case on how would you do that or how are you proposing to do that? Because it's a huge task. So I, I'd start with the first, que first question regarding the doctors. I think, uh, at least for my startup, the, the biggest knowledge we've gained over the last, the, the two, I think, knowledge is the biggest knowledge that we gained over the last year was that first of all, uh, you have to do a lot of the things by yourself. You cannot count on someone to give you some data to work on. You have to actually collect it and go through all of this. And the second thing is you have to have the right uh, way of presenting your product to the doctors. Because if you say this is an AI that can diagnose this kind of disease, what the doctor is going to think is uh, this will repla replace me, I don't like it. But if you present it in a way where you say, Okay, so half of your work is basically secretary work, filling out some shit into the computer and looking at data. Then you still have to, you still lack 400,000 doctor places in the European Union alone, so you have to work overtime. You don't have any time to familiarize with the new technologies. And then there's a ton of different other things. And if you actually present the product in a way where you say that this is something that will help you, in the end, you will either way get to have the final say. And in no means this can ever replace you because at the end of the day you still have to have some sort of approval from a human for the diagnosis to be valid. So if you put it like this, I think uh, since we have started putting it like this, our success has been much bigger. And then uh, regarding the second question about the data structuring, uh, I think uh, being in the U European Union has uh, a couple of advantages. And one of these advantages is that the European U Union, that is basically the governing body above us all and above the state level, should work on setting some kind of standards, some kind of uh, best, best uh, principles or best uses for different types of, let's say, data, uh, how the systems should be created. So you really need to work with the regulator to actually get the task done. And yeah, either you go to a private hospital where everything is done in-house and they set their own rules, but then if you go to a public hospital, there has to be a governing body that sets these rules. And I think for our region, the European Union is probably the best uh, authority to do so. Okay, so you touched on um, a very touchy subject of regulation. And I have a question for Uri because he has experience with regulation and policy. Um, and probably you have an input on uh, data and uh, your experience from Kosovo. I know it's not the EU, but... What do you think about uh, regulation and how could regulators um, help with this process and um, maybe regulatory sandboxes and uh, other solutions that might help the medical field? Mm -hmm. Also, um, what is uh, very important to understand that technology won't solve the problem alone. Uh, if we want to uh, change, uh, for example, the healthcare system and get all the benefit, we also need new companies and new kind of providers which will utilize uh, this technology. And in order uh, that this kind of businesses can operate, uh, we uh, probably, highly probably, will need to change uh, the regulations. And it also means uh, that in future, the role of doctors uh, will change. So there will be maybe some kind of small group of specialists will be more like data scientists and will uh, understand uh, origin and causes of this, uh, the disease and how it is work and for example molecular uh, level and then uh, there will be uh, this kind of maybe not so data oriented but people who can uh, give decision support can advise uh, to the people. And uh, they need uh, less uh, educated
education uh, than now uh, what it is needed. So for example, nurses uh, with uh, artificial intelligence can solve a lot of uh, the, the problems. And uh, now a uh, nurse uh, cannot uh, give you a lot of things. So uh, what uh, have to change, uh, for example, is that it will be allowed nurse uh, with uh, artificial intelligence uh, decision making the making support system uh, can, for example, heal flu or another diseases. But aren't the nurses providing the most medical care of uh, patients? Yeah, and in the future they will provide a lot of more care. So there is a lot of opportunity for um, technology and machine learning to actually help them to make better decisions and basically yeah. improve their yeah. decision making. Yeah, and for example with three year curves in mm -hmm. the future, they will uh, solve uh, problems as today practitioners. So uh, basically they are cheaper um, than the, for example to educate them and uh, this will be uh, why the system uh, can be more profitable or more affordable in the future. So basically this could solve the shortage of medical staff. So the shorter education and the supportive decision system can actually help with, because Martin, you mentioned the shortage of doctors, but there's also a huge shortage of nurses. So this could be a, a way forward to actually shorten the education and improve the decision making. And also with uh, another technologies, for example, I'm actually glad you mentioned telemedicine because we haven't talked uh, about the other side of the equation, the patient, um, and how the patient is actually responding to the new technologies. And if on one hand they are actually following the suggestions towards better lifestyle and prevention, um, because Martin, you mentioned that it's really important. And um, there's an example of a clinic in Iowa that is full um, based on telemedicine, there, there are doctors that are serving patients um, in a distance. So, how do you see the, the role of telemedicine, and, and how does we need how do we need to educate patients, and how do we treat them differently? Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to start out with uh, any time I, I, I'm sick or something, and I go to doctor MD or, or WebMD or what the site is, I end up with having cancer. So, I, so I do too. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, like, you can. I think a lot of people already Google their symptoms, and they use uh, simple symptom checking apps that eventually lead you to uh, some diagnosis. And I think the people are, are already willing to use this service, right? So, the problem usually is that the patient themselves doesn't know. Okay, if my hands hurt here or it hurts somewhere else, or they cannot. I think uh, really tell the doctors what the symptoms are. So. If we're able to, let's say, move up with var variables and, and maybe little medical devices that you could have at home, such as you have already portable e ECG scanners, you have a lot of other things. If we're able to one day move to a point where everyone or, or almost everyone will have an iWatch, and I believe that we will. Uh, I believe that we will. I, I'm pretty sure the Japanese already develop showers where you stand in the shower and uh, using, I don't know what, probably lasers, it, m it uh, measures your... Uh, body temperature and a lot of other things. So I think in the future telemedicine will also might maybe lighten the workload of the medical staff and people in hospitals. And uh, But we still have some advancements to be made. Really I think what we're struggling right now is uh, making first of all all the data accessible to a lot of people uh, that actually want to move on with this. And uh, this is the first step. And then, and that's what I understood with my startup at least, is that Okay, you can do cool stuff such as uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning and, and God knows what else, but you have to have the data. And until we figure out how we can keep all the data in one place, how we can provide access to the doctors or to the research teams by using anonymization, all of those things, only then we can go on and, and start talking more about telemedicine and all of those other things. But the interest is definitely there.
I actually want to come back to your startup uh, in a while, but I would like to ask together Martin about um, uh, his experience with regulation and um, basically how you can go past that because there are a lot of different solutions. There are maybe lifestyle um, trips, uh, tips and tricks, but um, how do you basically build something that uh, goes through a regulator and could be used as a medical device or what is the process? What's your experience? That's extremely broad question. Um, obviously you have, you know, health tech, which is like the broadest field and you have medical devices, software as a medical device, all these, all these applications have their own unique path through regulatory bodies and regulatory requirements. For most of them, you need to do some technological validation that the use of that specific software or device uh, doesn't kill you or is not toxic or that's usually in like four phases, same like in drug development. Uh, but uh, then you have a completely different universe, it's not even field, which is retail, where uh, a lot of devices, a lot of tests are subclinical, so they are available in uh, directly in pharmacies, like for example, you know, like low uh, specificity pregnancy test that you take, and it doesn't actually tell you that you are pregnant, it just gives you two. Uh, two marks, which is a suggestion that you need to go to a doctor and take a blood test, right? Which is a clinical test, and that's the major difference there. So depends like where you want to aim your product, whether to retail or to like clinical device. Uh, and then the path is that you need to first validate hardware, technology behind it. Then once it's validated, that you can, for example, efficiently, securely transfer data from your mobile to the cl cloud or something and then process it. Then you need to validate models. Uh, models could be descriptive. So just for example, assessing frequency of cough, just counting coughs, right? Uh, that's the first phase, but if you want to do anything about that, so for example, classify a patient to or diagnose, like go automatically through diagnostic tree, whether the patient has like a Bastard cough, wet cough, dry cough, whatever cough, even treated, like choking or whatever. Uh, that's another another round of validation for the models. Uh, so, so for me, like I, my background is uh, like in general in red tech, and there is a huge difference in bio, difference in biotech, and for example, banking. In banking, you can actually develop a prototype with a, a, a huge vendor, for example, big bank, right? And then apply it, test it, you know, let it test, uh, te uh, let it be tested by third party, and then go to the regulator and show him, like, look, this is a regulatory sandbox. This is the best practice in I don't know anti marketing with a lot of people, and and you already know that someone will use it, but but it's upside down, uh, and, and that kills like 95 percent startups that they don't actually think about regulation. So that's the part. I, I don't know if I answered. You actually did. Thank you so much. Um, uh, so let me come back to the other Martin. Um, we talked about uh, the way you're collecting data and how you go about that. So if you don't mind uh, using your example, because it's an interesting way of uh, gathering data since uh, there's lots of data this uns in unstructured form in different ways distributed across the world. Okay, so I'm also probably going to come back to other Martin's answer, and uh, <laughs> it's uh, you really don't know. For example, when we try to build our our medical startup, um, and we've been doing so for two years, we still don't have a product that's out there. The first year we spent basically looking for what is going to be needed, and what would be a cool thing to have. We consulted that with doctors, and then after some time, we actually found out it's impossible to do so because you don't have the data to train all the all the algorithms. Uh, so then we decided to do something else. We decided to find a use case that we knew that the data would be collectible by us without having to rely on, on third parties. Uh, and then also at least to some extent validated if there is a market for this idea and with our doctors on the team we eventually made, managed to do so. But what we're working on now, right now, is uh, we're trying to use ECG images to detect arrhythmia, so atrial, atrial fibrillation and so on. Uh, 
the way we originally intended to do do it was uh, basically go to the archives of the hospitals and find a lot of ECGs with uh, a lot of other data, uh, such as blood tests, you know, maybe diagnosis, and feed them into some system and then make the algorith algorithm uh, learn based on that data. And what we've actually ended up doing is that we developed an iPad app, which basically allows the doctor to take a picture of the ECG. This solves the data structure and compatibility issue because in the end, with every manufacturer, the ECG you get printed out of the machine looks the same, almost the same. Uh, however, if you'd like to have the data in digital form, you'd need to create one module per one manufacturer and maybe even per a different device from the same manufacturer just to get the data. So we basically developed an algorithm that using image recognition can digitize uh, paper form ECG. That way we don't have to combat the problem that we don't have uh, uh, digital data from 10 different sources. Uh, then what we have is another algorithm which can detect uh, uh, text from a blood test. So for example, the doctor takes an, an image of the blood test and then using all of this data, we can feed the algorithm. So for the beginning part, what our app does right now is that we analyze a lot of patients, analyze a lot of patients' data, of course, with respect with all the privacy laws and, and patient uh, basically allowance and, and all of those things. We do that and um, eventually, and of course the doctor also has, it, has his input. So we collect the ECG, we collect, for example, the blood test, blood test some basic uh, anamnesis, and uh, then the doctor tells us what his diagnosis is. We can also compare it to the guidelines that are for arrhythmias, that are issued every few years. Uh, so we can already use the data from the guidelines to get our diagnosis. And after, for example, 10,000 patients, what we can start doing is letting the app tell us what it thinks that the di diagnosis will be. And of course, that's when we're going to have to uh, face all the regulatory challenges and convince the regulator that the data, data is actually right. But uh, for now, we have solved the big issue of having a ton of different sources by really creating our own system, uh, starting our own data format for now, and really making it accessible. So basically, any doctor with an ECG that prints out paper uh, can use it. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's basically what we're doing. Great, perfect. Thanks so much for explaining that. Um, so we touched a lot on regulation and policy. Um, and I would like to ask you, Yurei, because um, looking at the example of, for example, NHS in the UK that uh, cooperates with innovative companies, do you see that happening in our region as well? And what are the barriers um, for that such cooperation? Uh, I think uh, we need a lot of more of such cooperation now. And also from this discussion, I think it is uh, pretty clear that if we want to move forward uh, in these new technologies in medicine, uh, we need somehow uh, to have very good regulation about access uh, to data for research purposes, for development purposes, and also um, because I think it will solve a lot of problem uh, of startups as uh, margins also. I think uh, it will be uh, very beneficial if our regulator uh, will be proactive in helping uh, with uh, this kind of uh, approvals and uh, studies uh, because a huge change uh, that uh, a regulator is called EMA for Europe, uh, that it will move from London to Bratislava, but we lost this opportunity for Amsterdam. And I think it, it uh, past, uh, we are different, we should be like future center of uh, this medical research, or artificial medical research in the future. And third, uh, when I'm reading the questions, maybe we need a new body uh, who will help, for example, monitor of performance of algorithms uh, somehow and try to deal with uh, the problems as a supervisor. So I have two questions following that. Uh, one is about um, basically uh, algorithms that, that are algorithms that are not biased and are ethical. Um, and second one is, do you think that creating uh, multi-stakeholder bodies that basically work as a discussion forum and propose solutions for regulation would work? 
Um, that's a question for all of you. And follow-up question on that one um, is about um, accessing data because um, as a private company, you basically want to keep that data to yourself. So how would you uh, propose to solve that? answer of the data questions uh, because, for example, it uh, needs to be a part of uh, national policy. There is framework uh, that uh, data uh, from uh, cleaning processes are somehow in anonymous or accessible for uh, another company. Because in China, uh, they already uh, they are very free to give uh, data to the uh, companies uh, by government. They are uh, leading the way uh, in this kind of research. Uh, in Europe, we are lagging behind. So something must change. Because, for example, it, it took like three years uh, to have access to data and be able to work with them. It took uh, too long uh, if uh, the algorithm needs to be like uh, up to date market. And uh, there was a first question that if we need a body. So, so basically it's about um, uh, for regulation to move faster and basically have a discussion or a forum where you have innovative companies, um, maybe traditional uh, pharma companies and all key stakeholders meeting at um, one forum discussing what can we do, how we can fasten the regulation, make it safe for the patients, but also quick enough to innovate. Yeah, I think uh, there is a huge need for such bodies but uh, there will be uh, still problems with interest in the system. So uh, I, I am pro of creation of such bodies, but uh, it depends who will be there and how they will be motivated to solve something. Uh, maybe uh, I believe that uh, such innovative companies will create their own body in the Western, uh, in the US, uh, they are some of them, and they can be more proactive in the advocacy and lobbying. So, gentlemen, uh, what do you think about um, having a way to talk to a regulator? That's one question. I think you have more experience. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, talking to a regulator, there are, there are best practices outside of, of uh, biotech, as I mentioned, and for example, banking where the relationship is not actually that the banks are sort of hiding in front of the regulator just to not be fined or something and and then the regulator comes and fines the bank because you know it finds it to launder money or something the biggest <coughs> banks are actually peacocking like in front of the regulator showing them their best practices because it's actually a strategic move for them where if the best practice is accepted they are of the of the radar and uh, and the uh, uh, comp uh, competition needs to implement what they already have. So that's actually a tactical advantage to have a good relationship with the regulator. I think that needs to be implemented in biotech and pharma. So do you uh, think that would work? And so it sort of already uh, began where huge companies, for example, Johnson's Johnson's with clinical innovation company Janssen, which is part of it, the biggest uh, biotech and pharma company with biggest market cap right now. Uh, they are collabora collaborating with other huge stakeholders and also hospitals, creating sort of also first ever data planning for like efficient data sharing across the companies, regulator, government, uh, the, the biggest players and also startups. Uh, and also they are creating that sample dimension that, that they want to talk with regu regulator in different regions also. Regarding regulation, I think uh, you, you have to understand all parties involved, right, in terms of healthcare. So you have, you have the state, right, in Slovakia we have public hospitals, we have the insurance companies, uh, then we also have the aspect of money, right? So uh, if you have two drugs that do the same thing, which one should be basically prescribed by the regulator to be used for a specific purpose? So I think... Uh, to be able to successfully push something through uh, this whole system of basically getting an idea, trying to validate it, trying to push it through into practice through the regu regulator, we have to look at all those aspects. So we have to look at 
who has what to lose and who has what to gain, and you have find you have to team up with the right players basically. And and we're not gonna fool ourselves. I hope uh, there is a lot of political lobbying involved and a lot of money involved. And uh, y I think you have to be able to navigate this kind of environment to make it through. And that's maybe also a problem of the of the current system is that the doctors and the people, uh, the scientists that want to do this, don't have the skill or the even don't think it's morally correct to basically uh, lobby in front of the regulator for such a thing. So you have to be really, we probably could host another speech about this, but at the end of the, ge of the day, if you want to push something through with the regulator, you have to understand all parties involved, who gains what, and then you have to be willing to lobby in the right direction with the right people, and it's just the way the system works, and uh, let's not kid ourselves. Want to add something here? Go ahead. Yeah, so I wanted also r to react to your second question on like who owns the data, and uh, like obviously the companies like us, we want to keep some data, you know, but uh, actually the best, best thing that could ever happen, I, I really highly doubt that it will happen, but would be if, if like a general population would understand that their medical data are owned by them, because uh, I would really like for them to have like a first 31st human right, right to own the data and treat it as their property, because I don't want to deal with some like freaking random hospitals to actually extract your data and then like a strike a deal with all of them and, and with the regulator and with government body and whoever, like you should decide who to sell, land or give for free for research your own medical data and they should be centralized on your like electronic medical record, all of it. Like, uh, like think about it, what is your data right now? So if you are an average person, you are probably suffering with some chronic disease like allergy or asthma or whatever you know, uh, s skin uh, issues are frequent, but you have like your data at your dentist. If you move the city, definitely at least two of them. You have your two GPs, one when you were a kid, second when you are an adult. Again, when you move cities, it's like four of them. If you wear glasses, you have your opticians, keeps your data. You have all these specialists when you were like one sick, uh, you have this like respiratory specialist, like it's completely fragmented. It sits in like a cupboard somewhere and I cannot really reach it. I cannot really help you with that. Uh, and the, comp the, the hospitals don't have a motivation to actually unify it. And who has the motivation is either like small startups who try to disrupt the medical field or biotech and then the huge corporations. Well, and they have much more money to actually get to that data. So uh, it's extremely limiting in this innovation wave that we're talking about when you don't own your data. So. Okay, um, that's a actually a very nice picture of um, owning your own data. Um, I see um, an issue of uh, actually educating patients about security and we're coming to a question of data security in general. But also, I actually, Yura, I wanted to ask you, um, don't, aren't you in a way of possession of your data? Or does it, 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 from policy perspective, you don't own your health data as a patient? Uh, not now. Okay. But, uh, there is initiative um, that should change it. And I think uh, from policy perspective, it should be one of the biggest priorities for the next year. Uh, there is... Uh, data law in Slovakia, uh, and this law should uh, deal with this issue. So uh, I think it is already uh, in the program of uh, the government, and we will see uh, if it works, but hopefully at least there will be a discussion, and it should start soon. And uh, yes, I think uh, this uh, my data initiative which uh, can democratize uh, the access to data and somehow to raise uh, uh, the awareness about how uh, the data can be managed for your own uh, society good uh, 
uh, this on the agenda. And uh, this kind of meeting is very popular in Finland. There will be Finnish presidency of European Council. And uh, from my information, it will be one of the highest priority points of the agenda. So owning your own data and liberating health data of yes. uh, citizens? Yes, not only health data, but all of data. Okay. So basically, it's an opportunity for startups in Slovakia to participate in a policy debate. Yes. Okay. So for all of you interested in data, you can participate in the debate. Uh, then, um, okay, I had two questions, but let me come back to the security um, question. And how would you ensure that the data is secure, um, that the algorithms are not biased? Um, what are the, the measures that could be taken? Because I think there was one question about that as well. Regarding security, you know, it's probably like any other business, you want your client's data to be secure. In this case, it's uh, patient data, and I think that is for the for the hospitals to figure out on their own. There is not something that <laughs> works in every case, and it also depends who has access, who can see what. But I think for the research to actually progress and for the products to be created, which is what I think I'm focusing on, we're focusing on, we don't actually need to know any private data of the patient in terms of name. We only need anonymized data, and at that point, the data security, again, is not such a big issue, right? And sorry, what was the second part of the question? The, um, the bias of algorithms and actually making ethical decisions and you know, not saying um, that we need to let these people die because uh, they are not worth living or it's too expensive to treat them or whatever, because um, if you don't know what's behind the algorithm, then it's harder for you to um, trust it. So it's about transparency and also bias in algorithms. How would you propose to solve that? The transparency issue, I think, is, uh, first of all, we don't have the general population understanding heavy technology. And that's why we have the regulation so that uh, broad population actually believes what we give them in terms of our algorithms and that's for the regulator to check and, and that's the reason they're there but regarding the ethical bias uh, people will always die and uh, that's I that's I pretty yeah. harsh <laughs> I think life is a deadly disease yeah that, that's a bit harsh that's a bit harsh to say but uh, at the end of the day I'm not quite familiar with any algorithm that would have killed some person. Uh, and of course, if you compare the, the level of error a machine makes to the level of, level of error to the doctor, I think you'll find out that uh, over time, the machines just get better than doctors, and it's a fact. People will always die. <laughs> and you can only decide whether to die by suboptimal diagnostics by current medicine or optimal death by AI. That's it. There's no other discussion. No, I'm joking. So the security, uh, the security of data. So it's hilarious to me because like, where the fuck are your data right now? How do you know that they are secured? Like on the paper in that like 70 years old gynecologist Hubbard, like wh how, what kind of security is that? And suddenly when you digitalize that, right, like it's all about the security. So I guarantee that when you implement the basic security principles of IT, like standard software development and data transfer, it's already like 1,000% better secure than it is right now. And then uh, specific like AI, again, uh, application, I mean, uh, regul regulatory bodies are already thinking of this. Like that's the first issue they need to solve. Your servers needs to be HIPAA compliant. You know everything. Like the data transfer is actually first thing that you validate if you're transferring any kind of data. If you want to pass the regula regulatory requirement, and uh, uh, and the uh, um, the the, the, out the bias bias models. Um, Biased doctors, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I agree that the, that the era uh, is is gradually minimal. But of course, again, like and and this is a big issue, and it's not solved on a regulatory level. Like 
how do you um, validate continuously a model that is learning? So of course we can like show you the model, we can show you there is a like fully describable model, like supervised learning, you know, it's an equation, it's not a black box. And then there is like a neural networks, whatever, which is a black box, the only, can, you can, only thing you can see is input, the weights, uh, how the input is weighted, and then output, and the result is actually the model itself, and that is like sort of itchy, or from the regulatory perspective, because you don't see what it does inside, but even again, like from other fields, it's actually acceptable to have this. So to have the well-described input, weights, and, and outputs is actually acceptable by a regulator. Um, but yeah, like I don't know, probably either within a current regulatory body or new body needs to be created that like continuously monitors. But it's actually, uh, it's your responsibility. It's not the regulator, like, so the regulatory body all around the world gives you advice on best practices. You don't need to follow the advice, but if you fuck up, you are fine. And if you, if even if you follow the regulatory advices, uh, and you fuck up, you are fine. So, so actually it's up to you to actually investigate and continuously improve your best practices. Otherwise you are fine. That's it. So you, in that sentence, is medical professionals, innovative companies, pharma companies, and yeah, yeah. okay. Um, we have um, one last question from my end, and that is for you to look in your crystal ball, ball and <laughs> looking at the new healthcare um, landscape, um, how do you envision it, and what do you see there um, happening in the near future in healthcare regarding technology? How does the technology change the healthcare sector? Well, I just say that, well, take a look back 20 years to where we were with computers. And I don't think the medical breakthrough with computers have been, has been made yet. The development will speed up drastically, I'd say. And the things that we're already starting to see in terms of uh, technology in healthcare is just insane. And once I think the first doctors start tra trusting the technology, then gradually the people start to tra trust the technology. We might need a doctor. <laughs> you have the choking app, right? <laughs> 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 well, anyway, uh, I think the future is very bright. You know, it's you first, of course, have to consolidate the data. That's step one we still have to tackle. Uh, medicine is not yet all digitized, all in the proper formats, uh, accessible by everyone. That's the first thing we have to figure out. And once we figure this out, and then we figure out uh, a way to basically present these technological advancements both, both to the people and to the doctors. So you also have to basically uh, account for some marketing and, and some time to pass. I think in 20 years, you probably have a machine at home where you just stand and uh, the machine will tell you exactly what's wrong with you. And of course, we still will have to have doctors, uh, but with what I've started in the beginning is that uh, people won't die of, of really stupid sicknesses just because they don't go to the doctor. We'll have something at home, and I think already in 20 years you might have enough. So basically you go buy groceries and you treat your conditions. Yes. Interesting. Okay, Martin. Near future, uh, I really believe that the first like the disruption in the field that's going to come is actually uh, that we will be getting out of hospital patients, and that we won't need to deal with any kind of input, information input. So there's this like a whole field of like patient reported outcomes. So every, anything that that the patient reports to the doctor in some like Likert scale one to five, how your pain is, or like uh, how uh, how much you you know coughed in past three months, like nobody knows. Fuck. But uh, so what what would happen, I guess, is that we will develop through the mobile devices probably and wearables ways how to passively collect clinical data. Passively. So that means that you are just like doing your everyday stuff and your watch plus your mobile phone counts your cough, 
uh, logs that your fatigue objectively, so you don't need to subjectively report it to a doctor or ca call him humble like a formal authority in white coat where you really try to clock as best as you can and, and that like disrupts whole prognostic and diagnostic process. Uh, same in a uh, huge improvements will be in neurodegenerative diseases and psychiatry where this is exactly what is missing. So objective measures of cognitive performance and there are already prototypes of applications that can actually assess drop of in your cognitive performance just by a mobile use of your everyday applications. So the way you input you know, words through your keyword, keyboard, the way you use your social media, from that data you can detect already that something is wrong with you. Uh, so yeah, I, I really feel that, that that would disrupt the field. I really don't believe that uh, regulatory bodies like on a global level would actually agree on something. Uh, some unified, for example, uh, data bytes or, or, or electronic medical re records. So the whole regulation, the whole technology and regulation need to go around it because it will be much quicker. And the data collection, which is goes to the mobile devices, so nobody will care about the history of data in hospital. Nobody will pick it up. And maybe at least one, and add one last thing to get you an understanding on what has been done by seemingly absolutely unrelated data. I read somewhere recently that some American university uh, made a study I think with Facebook and they could determine by the way that people chatted and posted to timeline if they're taking drugs or not. And uh, <laughs> when they gone and asked the students if they were high wave writing a few lines or some status or something like that, they almost got 90 or 95% matches. So seemingly completely unrelated data can already give the system an insight into your health.